today we're um, hugely privileged to be joined here at Leaders Inn by Eric Rees, uh, entrepreneur, author of global best-selling uh, book, The Lean Startup, and now The Startup Way. Um, Eric, welcome. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks really for having appreciate me. appreciate yeah, that. My pleasure. Um, we'd just like to start by sort of talking about following on your journey from the Lean Startup to the Startup Way. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about that and your, the, the experience of that? Sure. So the Lean Startup came out in 2011 and as you say, uh, became this global movement and uh, allowed me to really have like a backstage pass to the world of business, to travel all over the world, to meet startups and big companies, all of whom were invested in the idea of either as they scale up, trying to maintain that startup DNA uh, and continue to innovate and find new sources of growth, or in a lot of cases, a lot of bureaucratic organizations trying to purge that bureaucracy, get leaner, get uh, more efficient, simplify, and again, use innovation as a way to drive growth, to drive productivity savings. And the more I spent time with companies of these different industries, different types, different categories, the more I realized that the challenges of these hyper-growth companies has actually had a lot of deep similarities to these established companies that were trying to transform. And it kind of makes sense. No matter how old the company is, no matter how big or small the organization, we've been building organizations to a common blueprint for coming up on 100 years. And many of the challenges we face in the 21st century, that blueprint is not totally well adapted to solve. And so what we need to do is find a new blueprint for what really is a modern company, one that uh, can drive more adaptivity, more agility, uh, more responsiveness to change. So following on from the huge success of the Lean Startup, mm -hmm. could you tell us a little bit about the journey um, towards the, the startup way uh, and how sure. that all came about? Yeah, so the Lean Startup came out in 2011. And at the time, I was primarily working with technology companies in the venture industry. I live in Silicon Valley, my background's as a technologist. And I was hoping that uh, we could change the practice of entrepreneurship to make it more disciplined, more rigorous, more scientific, more customer-centric frankly, faster. And we could shift the conversation in the industry from just innovation is something you get lucky and it happens to you, to a process of continuous innovation, a discipline of being able to stay always ahead of the next wave, uh, seeking out new sources of growth uh, through a practice of entrepreneurship that was, uh, like I said, more rigorous. And I used in the book a definition of a startup uh, as a human institution designed to create something new under conditions of extreme uncertainty. So really a generic definition that talked about what a startup is not. It is not a small company. It is not in this industry or that industry. It's not about technology or about uh, private sector or public sector. None of that matters. What matters is uh, whether you know already what's going to work because you're extrapolating from a long and stable operating history of something you've done before or not. And that was 2011. The book became this global phenomenon and kind of took over my life. It's been quite a wild ride. And in particular, uh, since the book came out, lots of people have been coming up to me and, and asking me to try and apply those ideas in new domains, in, uh, in different size companies, in different industries, uh, inside of governments and, you know, all different size uh, bureaucratic organizations, people who, who are recent startups that have now grown past product market fit and want to kind of maintain their startup DNA as they scale, and others that have kind of lost that innovative spirit or maybe never had it, would like to see it reintegrated, reinfused uh, into their organization. So it's been a very interesting combination of experiences. I would often, even on the very same day, you know, would be with like government ministers in the morning and startup people in the afternoon, or Fortune 500 company in the morning and, and, uh, and a unicorn tech startup in the afternoon. And what struck me over the past few years is how often the conversations were the same. Hmm. We were discussing the same structural team composition, budgeting, HR, incentive issues over and over again. And it eventually dawned on me that it doesn't matter how large our organizations are or how old they are, they're all being built to the same blueprint, the same basic framework of departments and functions, the same matrix management philosophy uh, that we've been using you know, in organizational design for about 100 years. And then I thought, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. That The world we live in is a little different than the world of the 20th century. We should be using organizational forms that are more adaptive, and that ultimately led to my wanting to write the book. And is there one experience in particular that stands out that helped inform your thinking for the startup way? Well, it's more that I got permission to tell the story in some depth in the book about my work with the GE. Uh, there we built a program called FastWorks together, which was their version of Lean Startup. Uh, you know, it started with just one... Uh, one project, a diesel engine that we worked on to, to figure out what is the minimum viable product and get to market faster. And then we did 
you know, went from one project to four projects, you know, it was mm. like this GE. So it was like a refrigerator and we did a, a neonatal incubator and we did a combined cycle power plant and deep sea drilling. I mean, it just mm. every kind of project you can imagine. Uh, and then we started to do internal projects, IT projects, HR projects, finance projects, corp dev, what they call uh, commercial operations. So, so it got quite sophisticated. And then once they became convinced that the project, that this program could be effective at changing the way that they work, then we went to a full-scale deployment and trained thousands upon thousands of their managers. So it was a really a very instructive example, both because it was formative for me, you know, to transform a company with hundreds of thousands of employees and to to take lean startup into domains and scales that it hadn't previously been tried. But it was also really helpful because they were willing to be public about it because mm. they have a history of corporate transformation and that's something that, that they were comfortable talking about. Mm. Uh, and when you come across organizations that are a little bit further behind in their innovation and their transformation side of things that are used to traditional ways of working, that are pressured by next quarter's earnings, all of that, you, yes. and, and you get that senior management, which some get it, what are the ways in which you can kind of unlock that conversation to get them to talk and think more openly about structured experimentation well, and acceleration? Yeah, I, I feel like it's my job in those situations to be quite blunt and direct mm. with senior managers and say, look, if you're not comfortable with the innovation results that you're getting in your organization, mm. Look in the mirror. Now you're looking at the problem. Do you want to talk about the ways in which your personal behavior and the ways that you hold teams accountable could have an impact on this? That's usually the last conversation I ever have with senior executives. <laughs> yeah. you know, thanks for coming in, and I don't, you know, I don't mind. I'm not a professional consultant. It's okay. Um, but for those that are willing to have the conversation, we can talk about how this is not like a personality problem. It's not like they're intending to do something wrong. It's that they're using a management system that is rooted around concepts of forecasting, predictability, reduction of variation, and standardization. Mm. So those ideas are very useful in the common domains of work that we were in in the 20th century, and they're still very useful today whenever we do something with high repeatability, high predictability. But they're really quite poor in any kind of situation that faces extreme uncertainty, and in particular, the domain of entrepreneurship. Mm. So the conversation we need to have is, why are you busy paying people to prevent innovation? Mm. Right? Actually, your employees are naturally intelligent, creative, resourceful. They actually are full of good ideas that they're dying to put into practice, but your systems inhibit that. Mm. So you're operating this creativity dampening field across the whole organization. Mm. It's not that you have uncreative people. Mm. You're preventing their creativity from coming to work with them. They find it actually quite frustrating. So then what are the systems we can put in place to open up the possibility of more creativity? And again, mm. it's not gonna be a kumbaya, company-wide instantaneous, magic, mm. but systematically, bit by bit, we can experiment and test and discover how to unlock the unique innovative potential of every organization. And if we spend a bit of time on that, you talk in the book clearly about the sort of the road to, roadmap to transformation, you yes. talk about the three phases, recognizing that every organization is slightly different. That's right. But, but just at a high level, talking about those three phases sure. and that would be... Yeah, and this is not a prescription, this is an observation. Mm. I've seen this transformation play out in three totally different domains. I've seen many startups go through the S-curve of tiny, tiny little company to a big mature organization, and some of them do that repeatedly, refounding the company effectively yeah. as we go to greater scales. I've also seen it in companies like GE or Toyota. Uh, I was just with P&G a few weeks ago, where the transformation is being driven through a strategic initiative top down from the CEO mm. or doing a program mm. like FastWorks. And I've also seen it in the government. I talk in the book about a number of examples from the US government. Mm. I was just with some folks in the UK government today where uh, there's no reason why the bureaucratic and very political um, mechanics of how we implement policy have to be done in an old fashioned way. Mm. Uh, so in all of those cases, there seems to be a common pattern of how it plays out. Three phases, the first phase, the critical mass phase. Uh, identifying a diverse range of projects that encompass all the different kinds of things the organization does to first actually experiment and make sure these ideas really work. Please don't take it from me on faith. I'm not your guru. Like that's not, this is not a religion. This is a scientific theory. It makes very specific predictions about what should happen. So experiment, find out if I'm really telling the truth, make it, you know, work in that organization or figure out how it has to be adapted to translate the ideas into company-specific lingo, right? We called it FastWorks at GE. We called it Design for Delight at Intuit. Very mm -hmm. different corporate cultures, very different branding and messaging, different mm -hmm. ways of talking about common concepts. Um, the third is to test out all the different pressure points and bottlenecks and problems that are unique to each organization. So I'll give an example from GE. 
we had one team very famously in one of the early FastWorks workshops, they said, well, we're gonna to have to get approval mm. from all these middle managers to get permission to do this new plan, even though the new plan is obviously better than the old plan. And we said, well, just keep a little index card. How many meetings does it take? And we checked in with them a few weeks later. They'd had 40 meetings begging for permission to do something that was obviously better than what they were gonna do before. So being able to identify those problems gives us something to talk to senior management about. It's, it's one thing for people to complain, oh, our company is slow and bureaucratic, and mm. senior managers say, well, says who, and how do you know, and you know, why are you just complaining, or is it real, to say, listen, 40 meetings. Mm. That can't possibly be right, let's make it better. So, so we do that, we build up the critical mass, we show that this can work, and then at some point we can enter into phase two, which is the deployment phase, where the company, the organization makes a commitment to do this at scale, not just with pilot programs. So at GE, that took about a year to get from phase one to phase two. We probably had done 100 projects or something like that, so it's quite comprehensive, but quite fast. Uh, and then in the course of the second year of the deployment, we probably trained 5,000 of their senior managers. I mean, it was quite intense. Every CEO of every one of their businesses, all of the CEO's direct reports, all the functional staff functions, uh, the research center, HR, IT, everybody had to go through training. It was completely mandatory. Um, some, so again, in the different contexts, the trigger that unlocks that energy can be different. At GE, it was a strategic initiative. Uh, in the book, I talk about uh, an event from the U.S. federal government where we had a very public uh, debacle of a, of a website called healthcare.gov where people to sign up for health yep. insurance. It was almost derailed the Obama administration. And people who had been working in these pilot teams were part of the rescue effort that miraculously turned that situation around and you know, allowed 20 million people to get health insurance mm -hmm. and, and a lot of other good things but also were seen within the bureaucracy as heroes who had saved, uh, saved this program and then became part of a transformation of the digital side of the United States government, uh, including creation of new agencies and everything. So again, that was a crisis that led to this transition point. And of course, in a lot of startups, the transition point, the crisis is product market fit itself. Once the second phase plays out and we kind of produce broad literacy in the organization about what entrepreneurial management is and how it works, how it's different but not better than general management, then we can start to tackle phase three, the deep systems mm -hmm. of the corporation. At some point, in order for this to have real staying power, we have to change how people are promoted, how they are financially compensated and incentivized, how budgets are allocated to teams, and a whole raft of finance, legal, IT, HR policies that in most organizations act as gatekeepers that prevent innovation from happening. Mm. Uh, we have to transform those gatekeeper functions into enabling functions. And the key is that you can't make those kind of deep systemic changes unless you have the political power of phase two. So that's the why the sequence kind of plays out the way mm. that it does. And I know you can't be generalized about this, but as you go through those phases, as a company goes through those phases, where yeah. have you seen the biggest challenges and points? You talk about the transition bit. Is it Phase one, phase two. All, two, all the two, transitions two, are the hardest. Yes. First of all, from phase zero to doing nothing yes. to starting is quite challenging. To get the company bought in, the organization bought in at the executive level to do phase two is quite hard. And the phase three deep systems, I mean, these are very entrenched uh, programs mm -hmm. you think about. Uh, GE has a legendary employee management system, EMS. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a famous system mm -hmm. in HR circles. The idea that we were going to change that deep system. I remember one of the early teams I talked to, I asked them, hey, uh, what are the obstacles to you adopting this better plan? They said, oh, we couldn't do it because of EMS. And I mm. said, who's EMS? I didn't, I didn't know yeah, what it was. Yeah, yeah. And they said, oh, well, we have our personal KPIs tracked every year, for, so we can't, we can't deviate from the company's like, normal way of working because we'd be penalized in our, I call it your career equity, your future career prospects mm. would be damaged. And I said, well, okay, well, who do I talk to about getting that changed? I was like, I'll just go have some executive make an exception. And it's, it was as if I had said, who do I talk to about having gravity changed? Mm. You don't change gravity, okay. you just you know, try to get out of the way. Yeah. And so they, like, that was inconceivable in phase one that this would change, and yet in phase three it did. Mm. And, and when we talk about trying to embed, or we talk about validate learning into a culture, yeah. uh, in an organization that's traditionally focused on financial metrics and things like that, what are the pitfalls to avoid? So the hardest thing about being an entrepreneur is that we have this really bad habit of spending other people's money. And then they have a really bad habit of asking us what they got for their money. And we're really bad about that. And we don't always do a good job of framing that negotiation in a productive way. Like often what they'll say is, what did I get for my money? And we'll say, oh, I learned a great deal. 
Mm. And then it's like, well, what the hell am I going to do with learning? <laughs> you know, put that in the annual report, pay it out as a dividend. Yeah. Hey, shareholders, we have a lot of learning this quarter. Like nobody cares. Uh, but on the other hand, when we allow the negotiation to be only about the vanity metrics, like ROI, market share, gross numbers, like revenue, mm. we often miss our accountability targets by orders of magnitude. Can you imagine a you have some sales manager who's at a quarterly target, you don't even want to miss by 1% or 10%. Can you imagine? I promised you a million customers and I have 100, mm. but I learned so much, please. You know, like, that's unacceptable in most organizations. And yet, if you take seriously what I said at the top, that a startup is all about uncertainty, how are we going to make an accurate forecast? Mm. So how are we going to set up accountability targets denominated in vanity metrics that work? So we have to have a brand new discipline. We call it innovation accounting in the lead startup movement. Yep. That is about figuring out what are the leading indicators of future success and how do we hold people accountable to those. Yeah. What are the best ways in terms of trying to build cross-functional teams that really, really are effective at scale? I mean, it's, it's essential. We have to do it. Uh, in the early days, we can just do it by exception. You need a far-sighted executive sponsor to do it. I know, uh, I, I know an example uh, where you have like four different government agencies mm. that have you know complementary but not quite the same mission being forced to collaborate on mm. an individual project. That requires someone at the appropriate level of seniority to say, look, you have to do it. Let's experiment. Let's try. Let's yeah. make it happen. You don't blow up the whole agency structure. You just create pilot teams and programs and, and you experiment with it as a tool. Once you are convinced that that's a better way of working for these kinds of projects, you can adopt what I call the startup as an atomic unit of work. Mm. There's certain problems in any organization's life that just a startup is the right form to tackle it. Mm. Like some things require a committee, some things require a, a you know task force, some things require a work cell, like in the old lean manufacturing mm. day. Some things require a startup, a dedicated, semi-autonomous, cross-functional team. Uh, it needs to be funded a certain way, held accountable a certain way. It has to report its progress to a board. So like, there are rules to how you set up a startup as like a tool in your toolbox. Not that that becomes every way of working, but just to say, hey, when we encounter this kind of problem, let's throw a startup at it. Mm. And when you've got an organization that's started up, they've got the critical mass, they're getting going, and yeah. they're, they're trying to get into that scale-up phase yeah. properly at scale. If you had to give one bit of advice to the leadership team that are trying to get by into that startup to scale up mode. What would be that what would be that advice? So I think the biggest misconception among entrepreneurs is that you can cause scale. Scale is something that happens as the exhaust from an engine that's working really well. So some people look at that and say, oh, I want a lot more exhaust. Let me pour some junk in the engine to spew out more smoke, right? You wind up emulating the wrong things. Scale happens in a sustainable way when you follow the law of sustainable growth, which is when new customers come from the actions of past customers. Mm. And that can happen in a couple of different ways. I can take the revenue I make from one customer and invest it in customer acquisition. I can have a viral product where every customer that uses the product, it accidentally, inevitably invites others. Think of like a PayPal. In order to send money from person to person, I have to invite them into the platform so I'll have viral growth. Mm. Uh, or I can have what we call a sticky uh, or engagement-oriented engine of growth where uh, customers, that retention level is so high that customers come back again and again and again. If I had a business that had 100% retention month over month, mm. and it just had some natural, mm. let's say 5% a month word, over, word of mouth growth, mm. that would be like having a bank account that pays me 5% mm. interest compounded monthly. Mm. That's a great business. But the same business with a 95% retention rate is completely flat because my losses and my gains are absolutely petering out. So once we understand the model of how growth is supposed to work in our, in our product, we can try to optimize the inputs to drive that growth number, the exhaust that we're looking for. Mm. And you mentioned previously the sort of the notion of career equity yes. uh, and the sort of the combined effect of this frozen middle that you said potentially see in large organizations. Yeah. How do we start to unlock that? What are the sort of the, the, the challenges we need to overcome? Well, first, we just have to be honest about what's actually going on. So we love to blame middle managers and call them names like they're somehow bad. Mm. But middle managers have the hardest job in business, mm. which is they are uh, required to generate standardization and consistency of the company's procedures mm. without being empowered to change those procedures if they don't make sense. Mm. So they get blamed for all the bad results, but they don't have the power to change the method. So that's not their fault. <laughs> that's They're doing their job. They're being paid mm. to do this thing. And career equity is not bad. Every organization, people are very sensitive to their future career prospects. And if mm. it's a mission-oriented organization, these, then the equity is being paid out in non-financial terms. That's actually 
why mission-driven organizations can be so cost-effective is people are getting psychic rewards that are non-financial in nature. That's a terrific thing. Mm. But career equity is a matter of perception. So if people perceive that if I take a risk and it fails, I'll be perceived to be, by my peers, a failure that will harm my career advancement, they're not going to do it. Mm. You can actually pay them a financial bonus and they still won't do it mm. because the measly bonus is tiny compared to what the probability weighted outcomes I'm focused on with my mm. uh, with my career equity. So we have to align career equity with the outcomes that we want to have over the long term. We have mm. to reward people for taking risks if that's what we want them to do mm. and not just say that we'll reward them. People have to see that the way to get ahead and get promoted in this organization is to do the new behaviors. Mm. And. In terms of sort of high risk adverse markets, uh, highly legislative or regulatory uh, markets, sure, yeah. how do we use the methods and the techniques and the startup way to start to? Uh, Same. Uh, it's it's really not that different. I mean, look, we're talking about healthcare, financial services, mm. uh, drug discovery, uh, energy extraction. I mean, mm. uh, aviation. We've done this in the most mm. highly regulated mm. uh, environments in the worst. I mean, like you go into the intelligence community and do it for national defense, like. We talk about a regulated environment. It's a high, very high stress, high pressure mission. So, like, so we've seen Lean Startup work in all of those contexts. Um, I think the biggest misconception is most product teams in most organizations are set up in opposition to compliance and regulatory functions. So we have this adverse relationship. And I'll just tell you one story. Just I saw this with my own eyes. Okay, this is not a theoretical story. This is my firsthand witness testimony. Mm. Uh, there was a team or kind of healthcare product. And it was a high science, very radical, bold concept. And they had a lot of fights with the compliance people in that organization who were designed to make sure they were in compliance with the law. And this is a US company with the FDA. Mm. And they were constantly showing up with those people. There's a kind of one person in particular that was like a mean, nasty troll person who just hated their guts. And they just, whenever they would try to do something new, that guy would show up and say, you can't do it. No, no, no. He was like Mr. Scold. And I was telling them that if you want to be a real cross-functional team, and like a startup, you have to have all the functions represented on your team. You need to have a compliance and regulatory expert on your team full time. And they're like, do I really have to? Yeah. I pushed them really hard to do it. They said, fine. They put in a request. Please send me a compliance person. Compliance regulatory said, no, we don't have anybody to spare. I said, no, no, you don't understand. You have to pay this person's salary out of your program budget. You don't borrow money from them. You have to put someone full time. So that we have to spend our money on, yeah. So they did it. They put in a request. We'll pay the person's salary. Okay, guess who they got sent to be on their team? This is obviously the punchline. Mr. Troll shows up. Mr. Skull, the guy who hates them the most, is now assigned to work on their team full time. I said, that's terrific. Mm-hmm. So they came out to San Francisco for a workshop. And he was kind of doing this for the first time. He was not happy about being assigned to this team. It was like complaining constantly. We're doing this workshop explaining minimum viable product and lean startup and all the the ideas we're talking about. And at a certain moment in the workshop, he says, excuse me, I have a question. Yes, sir. Are you telling me that I'm going to get to be involved with the design of these ridiculous experiments from the start instead of only at the 11th hour? I said, yeah. Interesting. Didn't say anything else. Okay, continue. Workshop, workshop, we do the breakout session. Now the team's gonna start brainstorming different minimum viable products that they could apply to learn more about what customers really want with this medical device, this device sold to hospitals. And we're having the discussion, and at one point, one of the team members is brainstorming a specific experimental idea. And the, another team member says, oh shoot, that's a great idea, but everyone knows uh, it's illegal. You can't, you can't sell, pre-sell a medical device if it doesn't have regulatory approval. So we can't do it. Everyone's like, ah, shoot. Mr. Scold's sitting here and he says, excuse me, does it strike any of you as kind of like the United States federal government to publish a regulation that's one sentence long that just says you can't do this? And they're like, now that you mention it, that's not really their style. I was like, no. Uh, It'd be more like their style to publish, say, a 1,000-page detailed memo with 10,000 footnotes. And they're like, "Uh uh-huh. Have any of you read the relevant statute that we're talking about? No. Well, guess what? I have. That's my job. And did you know that on page 875, sub bullet A, you know, sub paragraph 3, mm. footnote number 4, mm. there's an exception to the rule you just mentioned, and the MVP that you just described is legal. Mm. And the jaws in the room were going to hit the floor. People mm. couldn't believe it. And I'll never forget this one of the team members said, 
are there any other exceptions? Mm. <laughs> right? Like what? And he's like, well, step into my office, my mm. friends. Like I, that's I thank you finally for asking me. Did you know if you designed it on this, 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 mm. and this, then the FDA would love? And it was we were off to the races, and all of a sudden, had a totally productive conversation that had never happened here before in the organization's history. Mm. Very powerful. And in terms of. Um, are, are, in your experience, seeing any sort of cultural differences between, say, U.S. and European countries are starting to try to apply the startup way in lean principles, or is it, is is that sure? I mean, everyone everyone's always concerned about cultural differences. My experience so far has been that they're pretty much surface characteristic issues. You know, that mm. there are cultural differences, and you know, and, and American companies especially have a hard time when they are trying to go into new markets. Sometimes they forget that different markets are different. Different countries have different mm. cultures and three different languages, and they get surprised that that doesn't work. So you know, there there is there is the occasional difference, but I found that to be far more surface level than really deep level. Um, you know, different cultures have different uh, risk tolerances, kind of what they celebrate. There's some policy issues that have to get sorted out in different countries around risk taking and personal liability mm -hmm. for failure. So like, there are real, they are real issues. But but far, by and large, so far everywhere I have gone, you know, everywhere I've met. With companies and gone to events, I've been you know I've been here all week uh, uh, launching this book in London, and you know the response has been really positive, and people have. They, they, I guess what I want leaders to understand and hear is that the people that work for you are bubbling over with excitement mm -hmm. about the possibility of working in a more creative way, and they actually would prefer to be held to a stricter level of accountability and less BS and less politics mm -hmm. and more of an empirical results-oriented culture. People are very hungry for that, and that's been true in the US, Europe, Asia, everywhere I've been. Mm. And in that vein, can you tell us a bit about the long-term stock exchange? Sure, sure, yeah, uh, I have a new company called the Long-Term Stock Exchange, the LTSE. Uh, it is a new way for companies to be public without the short-term pressure. Mm. So it's a national securities exchange, similar to you know NYC or NASDAQ uh, in the US. We use different corporate governance standards, kind of hold companies to that higher standard uh, and to uh, create better alignment of interest between management and investors whoever are looking out for the long term. Mm. I can't say a lot about it because mm. this is obviously a highly regulated issue and yeah. I'm, we're yeah. in the midst yeah. of negotiation yeah. 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 with policymakers and regulators now to uh, win their approval to do it, but that's, that's, our, that's our goal. Well, I we wish you huge success with that. Well, thank and, you so much. Thank you so much for coming in today. We really appreciate really it. Really my pleasure. Thank you. Great. Thank you.